Hello, and welcome to Up to Speed with Online Teaching. My name is Jonathan Haber, and this last lesson on how to apply professional test development principles to the creation of assessments and assignments for online courses, I want to cover the topic of test analysis. Now, this is a somewhat more advanced topic than you've seen in previous videos, but as I hope you'll learn, each one of the methods of analysis I'll be showing you can be applied to the work the teachers do. Now, if you recall, professional test developers use what's called the backwards design process that begins from goals, moves on to planning, and then generates content before performing the analysis you'll be learning about in this video. And in previous videos, you've learned about goal setting, you've learned about planning, you've learned about how to create linear test content, as well as rubric scored performance assignments. Now we're going to move on to test analysis. Now, professional test developers perform analysis. They're doing what's called test validation. And there's three different kinds of test validity. One is called content validity. That's to determine the content in your assessment cover the right things and uh, does it have the right balance? Construct validity is determining the methodology or the mechanism you're using for testing. How closely does that correspond to what you're measuring? Finally, criterion validity is sort of the gold standard where you're proving that your test scores correspond to how well somebody does on an independent measure of the same knowledge or skill. So let me go through each type of validity and show how it can be applied to the work of teachers. So to begin with, content validation, uh, you have seen this blueprint before. If you watch the video on planning, this is a blueprint from a professionally designed certification. It's got domains. It's got very clearly articulated learning objectives. And this is used as the blueprint to build a test. We determine how to balance content. And we did this by giving this to several hundred subject matter experts and having them fill out a survey. Now, in this survey, they had to look at each learning objective and indicate its level of importance and its level of frequency of use. Those numbers were crunched, and we came up with a statistical content balance for the exam, right? The exam had three domains, one on computer hardware, peripherals, and troubleshooting, one on computer software, and one on using an operating system. And this analysis showed us that if the exam had 29% of the questions on domain one, 28% on domain two, and 43% on domain three, that it was a content valid exam. So how can this be applied to assessments that are not uh, certification grade? Well, here's a test blueprint uh, from a course. This is a course on omens and oracles, I believe. And as you can see, the domains are weighted differently. The first domain covers simple vocabulary, and that's just uh, weighted for 10% of the test score, whereas the last domain is more of a a challenge where you have to identify and explain something. And so in that case, that's uh, going to be weighed 40%. So in other words, the fifth domain is worth four times as much as the first domain. And if this is going to be entirely a linear test, this might mean you have four times as many questions covering domain five as domain one, or maybe domain five has open-ended items or more difficult items, and it's going to be assigned four times as many points as a multiple choice item for domain one. So here's how you could be applying the content balance principles, content validation principles to your tests. What does that buy you? Well, first it gets you to create a detailed test blueprint. And as you learned about earlier when we talked about planning, that's a very important step in creating high quality assessments. It also gets you to think about what's more important than what in your exam by weighing domains within the blueprint, as you just saw. I forgot to mention, but in that survey, we also asked public matter experts to give us feedback on each learning objective. That basically gave us a chance to review, just as you could review test content, whether those are test items or elements in a rubric scored assessment, review them against your learning objectives to make sure they're actually covering your learning objective. That's also part of the content validation process. And finally, distribute your questions and points based on your weighted domain. This helps you prevent your test being lopsided, uh, that would be a case where you might have too many items covering less important subjects, too few items covering the more important or more complex subjects. So elements of the content validation process you just saw can give you stronger assessments. Uh, now, in terms of construct validation, as I mentioned, that is how well does the way you measure something correspond to what you're measuring? This is best explained by way of example. For instance, a swimming test, that's a performance-based test, right? No one takes a written multiple choice test to be tested on their swimming ability. They jump in the pool and start swimming. And there might be some variation in terms of what strokes you are asked to perform or how long you have to tread water. But fundamentally, there's a really a, a close, tight correspondence between the swimming test and the skill that you're being measured on, which is your ability to swim. 
The theory of driving test, which is also performance-based, might be considered to also have a very close to perfect construct. But if you think about it, there is a component to the driving test, which is multiple choice. At least in, in my state, you have to pass a multiple choice test to get a driving permit. And at that point, you can get behind the wheel. And even when you're taking your live driving test, you may not do things you do as a driver, right? You may not drive on the highway, for example, or you may actually do things that you rarely do as a driver uh, in Massachusetts. Part of the driving test is you have to drive backwards along a curb for 100 yards. No one knows why. I had to do it when I was a kid. My children have to do it. But that's part of the performance task. So you could say this is also a performance-based test that corresponds very closely with the skill you're measuring, which is driving, but not perfectly. This becomes more relevant when we talk about tests with a much subtler construct, like in the SAT. These are college admissions tests, so they claim to test readiness for college, but they are mostly linear tests. And what are they measuring? They're primarily measuring language and math skills. So the construct for the SAT and the ACT is that language and math skills corresponds to college success. Okay, now the people who produce these tests have years of research to show that there is a correspondence between language and math skills and success in college. But I would venture to say that one of the reasons colleges are going to test optional, even before the coronavirus crisis, is that they're losing confidence in that construct. Now, in terms of your assessments and assignments, this just means you should be thinking about how well the assessments you create or the assignments you create correspond to what you are actually asking students to be able to perform. This is probably be more simple in a writing assignment. The complexity of the writing assignment corresponds to the complexity of the skills you want students to perform. But in other assignments, in chemistry exams where you ask them to perform chemical derivations or in performance tests where you ask them to give a live presentation, for example, you should be thinking about how closely your assessments correspond to what you're measuring, which really says how tightly your tests correspond to the construct of what you're trying to evaluate. A okay, criterion validation, I mentioned this is sort of the gold standard, and this is where you are measuring your test scores against some independent criteria. And as you can imagine, one of the challenges of criterion validation is coming up with an independent criterion, right? If you're going to measure your the test scores of your new test against another test that people already have confidence that measures what we're trying to measure, well, why create a new test, right? You already have a test that works. So in the case of professional test developers, we usually measure test scores against a variety of criteria. In this case, uh, this is a criterion study where we measured test scores against a survey. Uh, this was, happened to be a self-report survey where people would answer questions in a very carefully constructed survey designed to measure their computer literacy, and that we compared the test scores to the survey scores, found a linear relationship, and that indicated that the test was measuring what we claimed to measure. So how can you use some of the principles of criterion validation when you're looking at your classroom assessments or online assessments? Well, to begin with, you know, understanding the concept, even if you don't directly use it in most teaching situations, can be valuable. Why? Because there actually may be some independent criteria formal, informal, you use to evaluate student work. For example, if, if you're teaching at a grade level where students are going to be taking standardized tests, in a way, the test you give them during the term is going to be measured against how well they do later on a standardized test. Similarly, quizzes you might give early in a semester might need to correspond with how well they're going to do on a final exam, or short writing assignments may correspond to how well students are going to do in a longer written project. So generally, you want to sensitize yourself to the relationship between measures you're using. Okay, finally, I want to cover the topic of test analysis. When professionals develop tests, we usually go through what's called a beta process, where we create test forms for the same content balance using the principles of content validation I just showed you. And we test a statistically significant number of people of known ability, high, medium, and low performers. Okay, why do we do this? Well, we want to generate data for test analysis, and that analysis includes item analysis. We want to look at how well our items performed. A distractor analysis, which gives us insights on how individual questions did and why. And then test calibration. We want to come up with a cut score for the test. After that, we can create the final exams and release them. So in this case, I want to go over some of that post-beta analysis. That's going to be most relevant to some of the work that uh, teachers do. Okay, so in this case, 
This is the result of an item analysis, so let me explain this data to you in a little more detail. You've got five items, one through five, and each one's corresponding with two statistics, a p-value, which corresponds to difficulty, and an r-value, which corresponds to consistency. Now, the p-value is easy to understand. That's just how many people got the question right or wrong. In this case, 93% of the people got the first question right, 94% of people got the second question right, so those are both easy items, in comparison to items four and five, where most of the people got it wrong, so those are more difficult items. The R value is a little more complex, but you could think of it as an analysis of how well somebody did on that item versus how well they did on the entire test. Okay, so for example, on item two, 94% of the people got the item correct, so very few people got it wrong, but the few people who got it wrong didn't do well on the test. Most of the people who got it right did do well on the test. This is in comparison to item one, which has very low consistency, which means the few people who got it wrong were all over the map. Uh, similarly, if you look at items four and five, those are both easy items. The last item, item five, is less difficult than item four. But if you take a look, item five doesn't discriminate very well between people who did well on the exam and people who did poorly on the exam. It's got a very low R value, as opposed to question four that has a very high R value, meaning it does discriminate well between high performers and low performers. So in this case, item four has a very low P value, likely because it's simply a difficult question. Whereas item five has a low p-value, probably because something's wrong with it. We'll take a look at an example of what can go wrong with an item in a second. But before we do, I just want to uh, look at item three for a second, because item three is almost a perfect item. It's got a p-value of 0.5, meaning half the people get it right, half the people get it wrong. And it's got a high r-value, meaning it discriminates very well between high performers and low performers. So perfect tests might consist entirely of items with a statistic. Now, in the real world, you're very rarely going to get a, get a test where every item has a p-value of 0.5. Okay, you're going to generally have more easy items and some harder items in a test. But generally, you should have items that overall discriminate well between high performers and low performers. So your test items are actually measuring the skills you want to measure. And as I mentioned, we will take a look at what can go wrong with an item, and you do that, in this case, with what's called a distractor analysis. Here's an item with a problem, right? It's got a low p-value. Most of the people got it wrong. But it also, more significantly, has a low R value, which means the item is not discriminating between high performers and low performers. And to find out why, we could take a look at how people answered each of the responses in the test item. In this case, the correct answer is D. But if we look at the distractors, which are the wrong answers, A through C, the first two distractors were evenly distributed, right? 15% of the people answered A, which is incorrect. 15% of the people answered B. But notice answer C, the same number of people answered C, the brain, as answer D, the correct answer of the nervous system. And if you think about the test question, C is a perfectly plausible answer, right? Given this metaphor, it could be the nervous system, but it could just as well be the brain. So here we have a bad distractor. We have a distractor that is just as plausible as the correct answer. And that's why this item performed poorly. So we have to either come up with a new distractor or toss the item and not include it in our test. And I just will spend a second on cut score determination because you see this chart previously. So in this particular example, we have a survey and we determined that 30 was the cut score between masters and non-masters. Just follow that line up to where it intersects with your test. And we come up with a cut score of 78%. So just wrapping up, I'd like to highlight the benefits teachers get out of applying principles from the professional test design process to their work. First of all, you end up with higher quality assessments and assignments. I'm hoping if you followed through all of these videos, you'll see why that's the case. So planning, uh, application of item writing principles, uh, and principles of analysis can give you higher quality assessments and assignments that correspond more closely between what you're teaching and what you're trying to measure. The analysis methods we covered in this video can help you determine how well an assessment or assignment is working. And finally, and ultimately, this allows your assessments to provide you better understanding of student learning. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed this course. Uh, if you go to my website, www.degreeoffreedom.org, there's a link in there for resources for teachers teaching during the coronavirus crisis that include these lessons. Uh, if you've come to these lessons from YouTube, the lessons on the Degree of Freedom site include some test questions so you can see some of these principles in action. And I'm hoping to develop more material for teachers to help through the crisis that you'll find uh, on the site. So. So I want to thank everybody who stuck through this course. I hope you got some value out of it. And finally, I want to thank you for everything you're doing and wish you the best of luck.